of the morning in Australia. So uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you all uh, back to the medical ethics course. Welcome to a few of you who had some difficulties last week uh, in joining us. There were one or two people who couldn't manage. Somebody's uh, link went into trash uh, and uh, couldn't make it. And one or the two other people had difficulties uh, and one or two other people were still at work. So if this is your uh, first week, welcome to the first week. If you were here last week, uh, welcome back. Uh, Avril will tell me later on uh, who hasn't turned up for the second week and therefore didn't like it in the first week. Uh, but uh, those of you that are here and have come back, I assume that uh, you at least didn't hate it. So uh, what we did last week, just to recap, was we uh, spoke about the uh, first two of our major principles of medical ethics. Uh, the idea of uh, doing benefit for the patient and not doing harm to the patient. Um, and we uh, applied that to a rather difficult case. I threw you in at the deep end with a, an end of life case. We'll be speaking about end of life matters in some detail in a different uh, session, not in this one, uh, in, not in detail at least. Um, and then at the end of it, we spoke about the halachic view on uh, beneficence and non-maleficence as it's called. Um, so this week I want to take on uh, the next of our major uh, categories of, uh, uh, of medical ethics and that is the category of autonomy. Now I sent out, uh, or um, Avril did, sent out the worksheet uh, for this week. So those of you that uh, printed it out and have it in front of you, now's the time to look at it. I am going to share my screen um, with you so that those of you that don't have it uh, will see it on my screen. So uh, can you see the screen with the uh, worksheet on? Just give me a thumbs up if you can see that, please. Yeah, good. Okay. So uh, there's our, our, our starting point. Uh, these are the major categories of uh, med medical ethics that we're going to uh, speak about over the next few weeks. And today we're going to talk about the idea of autonomy. Now, this is probably going to be the most difficult of all of them for us, because without letting into, you to, into too many secrets at the beginning of the session, we're going to find some difficult halachic concepts today, uh, which uh, you'll find are somewhat at odds with modern uh, secular ethics. Uh, some of you will find the halachic approach uh, difficult to uh, come to terms with, uh, but I hope that by, uh, by the end of the session, that everybody will at least have an idea of where the uh, halacha is coming from, why it is as it is, and how important it is to assess every case on its own merits um, so that uh, the halacha is applied correctly um, and not incorrectly, as we will see as we go along. I'm going to give you some uh, examples of how Sadly, the halakha is applied incorrectly and can end with a disastrous consequences. So let's start by going through what we mean by autonomy. Now, the first half of this uh, session is going to be uh, given over to the uh, secular approach to this subject. Then I'm going to ask you to break up into your rooms and discuss one or, one or other of the cases that I set for you. Uh, and then we'll come back and uh, discuss the halachic side of things and then tie it all up together. So we're speaking now about the secular approach, the Western world's approach to the concept of autonomy. Uh, and... Autonomy essentially means self-rule. Uh, it's the basic human right. And what it means is that I, uh, 
the individual have the right to make decisions about my own life. Um, and, and this can be quite difficult, really, when it comes to um, what, what is described here as paternalistic attitude of many healthcare professionals. Um, we've, we've got a few healthcare professionals here with us uh, tonight. Um, and those of you that I can see are all of uh, round about my vintage or a little bit more vintage than me, let's say. Um, and therefore, you will all have been taught uh, your medicine in a rather paternalistic way, as I was. In other words, uh, what, uh, what we were taught uh, is that you're the doctor, you're the Mr. Fix-It or the Mrs. Fix-It. Uh, the patient comes to you with a problem. They tell you what the problem is. You tell them what the solution is and they go away and do it. Doctor knows best. That was the sort of approach uh, that, we, that we were taught. I was just the back end of it, really. Uh, when I did my uh, postgraduate GP training, so we're talking about the early 1980s, it was just changing in that uh, the idea of being reflective uh, and asking the patient what they thought about uh, matters uh, uh, was just coming in. Uh, it was it was all a bit new and uh, and raw around the edges when when I trained in, in the middle 1980s. I can see Laura uh, Freed with us here. She's a little bit less vintage than me, uh, and she might have had a little bit less paternalistic uh, uh, training than me. Uh, uh, but the idea was that that basically we were the guys that that told the patients what the solution to their problem was. But as time has gone on, uh, that has been eroded uh, very considerably. And it is now very much frowned upon to be a paternalistic doctor. Uh, what you're meant to do now is to say to the patient, uh, and, and what do you think uh, we should do about these things? And to have a discussion with the patient and that they should be very much part of the decision-making process. That's not to say that all the patients like that. Um, some of them don't, uh, some of them do, and some of them don't. Uh, I've had many patients come to me, uh, having been to one of my younger colleagues and said, well, I went to Dr. So-and-so down the, down the corridor and he said, well, what do you think it is? Well, I said, I don't know, you're the doctor. I don't know what it is. I can't be doing with that. So I've come to you because they know that I was fairly paternalistic in my approach. That was just the way I practiced my medicine. Um, so the idea of autonomy uh, is a little bit in, in, uh, in contrast to the paternalistic approach uh, that many of us were taught. Um, but as I've written here in the second paragraph, a respect for patient autonomy is probably the single most talked about principle or concept in medical ethics. Uh, and I think that is true. Uh, and woe betide you, God forbid you tread on the patient's autonomy today, uh, then you are uh, you're asking for 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 trouble. Um, so in medical practice, what do we actually mean? There are two principles uh, of its autonomy that we need to think about. A decision is only autonomous uh, if two uh, major criteria uh, are present. Number one, and that is that there is no coercion. In other words, it's only an autonomous decision. It's only the patient's decision if there is nobody else coercing them, forcing them to make that particular decision. So for example, a, a, a woman who comes to the, uh, the doctor's surgery uh, uh, in early pregnancy together with her partner, uh, who says that they might want to have a termination of pregnancy, the doctor will have to establish whether that is her auto autonomy, autonomous decision or whether there is a degree of coercion uh, from her partner uh, because that decision may not be her decision. That may be the decision that the partner is uh, forcing upon her either uh, openly or subconsciously. So the, the idea of auto, an autonomous decision, the first thing you have to do is to uh, make sure that that decision is given freely. 
and without coercion. The second important point of autonomy, and this is really uh, very important indeed and has become even more important in British uh, uh, law uh, since 2015, and that is the idea of informed consent. So in other words, a decision can only be properly autonomous if the person has the correct capacity to make that decision. So clearly somebody who uh, is either seriously mentally unwell or has a uh, disease such as Alzheimer's disease, which robs them of the capacity for rational thought, they cannot make uh, an autonomous decision because they don't have the wherewithal to do it. it it's, you can't ask a uh, two-year-old child whether they would like to go to school or not, or whether they would like to cross the road or not. They don't have enough capacity to make that decision. So uh, capacity uh, or lack of capacity can be temporary or it could be permanent. So somebody who, who, uh, is, who is suffering from uh, uh, advanced uh, dementia, let's say, uh, may not have the capacity to make an autonomous decision. Somebody who is suffering from a temporary loss of consciousness, so for example, somebody who uh, has had a, a head injury and is in a coma, uh, may not be able to make a decision at that time, although in future when they regain their conscious level, they may be, have full capacity. So the idea of an autonomous decision uh, can only be really uh, come into play when a patient has those two aspects, they have to have freedom uh, from co coercion and they have to have capacity to make the decision. Capacity in the mental capacity to understand what's going on and they have to have the information uh, uh, available to them so that any decision that they make is with informed consent. And I mentioned 2015, there was a case uh, um, of Montgomery versus Lanarkshire uh, Health Board, uh, where there was a case uh, where a woman was not uh, given the appropriate information as to what might happen in a certain circumstance. This was a woman who uh, was giving birth and, and was not told of the uh, possibility of what's called shoulder dystocia, where the baby's shoulder got stuck on the way out. Um, and this was a landmark case which uh, set in, in, uh, in law, reset in law, really, in British law, the idea that it is in, incumbent on doctors and other healthcare professionals to supply patients with the requisite information they need to make autonomous decisions. So that's what autonomy says. So the UK, the UK law in terms of uh, autonomy was uh, set down for us by Lord Donaldson, who was master of the rolls. This was one of the last uh, decisions that he made as, as uh, master of the rolls. He was master of the rolls from 1980 to 1992. And he said an adult patient who suffered from no mental incapacity has an absolute right to choose whether to consent to medical treatment. This right of choice is not limited to decisions which others might regard as sensible. It exists notwithstanding that the reasons for making the choice are rational, irrational, unknown, or even non-existent. So what Lord Donaldson was saying is that as long as the patient has capacity and is not co coerced, then even if you disagree with that decision, even if you think it's bonkers, even if you think it's irrational, or even if there is no reason for it, unless there is a, a, a position to say that this patient has no capacity to make that decision, then he has an absolute right to choose whether he has a treatment and which treatment he has. Now that is a very clear statement uh, which was enshrined in, in UK law and remains the case and is not just in the UK. That is a principle which exists across the Western world. Uh, the conditions for autonomy, we've spoken about that. Um, 
And what about where um, decisions where autonomy is lacking? So uh, given that there is this, this very powerful, uh, uh, powerful uh, movement, if you like, powerful law that respects uh, the autonomous decision of uh, people who have capacity, then uh, what about what we have to do when they don't have capacity? What do you have when, uh, when you have a situation in the case we said before, like I've written down here, the case of the, the uh, young woman who visits the GP uh, um, to discuss a termination of pregnancy? What do you do about uh, the person who doesn't have mental capacity? Who makes that decision for them? Who takes on the role of their best interests? Um, John Stuart Mill, philosopher of the 19th century, uh, he uh, wrote about this. This is not something which is new. It's not something which was revolutionary that Lord Donaldson wrote. He was really just uh, um, enshrining it for us in, in simple legal terms. John Stuart Mill said the following, the only part of the conduct of anyone for which he is amenable to society is that which concerns others. In the part which merely concerns himself, his independence is of right absolute over himself, over his own body and mind. The individual is sovereign. That was John Stuart Mill uh, in the 19th century. So what about when they don't have that capacity to do so? Then decisions must be made on their behalf. So, for example, very young children who don't have that capacity, um, are usually it's the decision is made by their parents or guardians. Uh, sometimes it's by the courts. Um, and where adults lack capacity, um, then uh, often it's the healthcare professionals who are in charge of their care. There will be multidisciplinary teams uh, who will make decisions on behalf uh, of the patient who doesn't have capacity. And sometimes the courts intervene in that as well and have a best interest uh, hearings and the court will act in the best interest of those patients. In other words, they are taking on the role of autonomy of the, the individual. But what is clear is that uh, in the modern secular Western world, the concept of autonomy is so strong that the idea of forcing patients who have capacity to uh, do one sort of action or another uh, is uh, repugnant uh, and is not legal and is fraught with problems. And as you will see later on, uh, we're gonna uh, come uh, uh, into conflict with the halakha, uh, which is not in entirely in accordance with uh, Western society on that point. So let's have a look over here, a simple case. Anorexia nervosa. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with that condition. This is a condition, it's a mental health issue where patients have distorted body image. Um, they believe themselves to be too fat and they stop eating and they uh, can end up being very, very unwell. They become very thin. They don't, they're undernutritioned uh, and they can, in, in extreme cases, it can lead to death. Um, and there is a moral uh, dilemma. Does one uh, force feed somebody who is suffering from anorexia nervosa? Uh, and it is a decision which is uh, not taken lightly it's a decision which is taken uh, very often, uh, that the, 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 co the conversation is had very often in mental health uh, hospitals up and down the, uh, the country, in every country, because anorexia nervosa, where patients are, um, uh, are in danger of their health and their life, is, is not an uncommon condition. And the question has to be asked, uh, do these people have capacity? Does this particular individual that we're talking about have capacity, and if they don't have capacity, on what grounds do they not have capacity? And if they do have capacity, are we uh, entitled as healthcare professionals to say to them, uh, we're gonna force feed you. Uh, we're gonna ensure that you don't die 
from uh, this condition uh, and we're going to force feed you. Um, and because we've seen that uh, according to, uh, um, let's just go back to Lord Donaldson, um, who said that it, this, this right of choice exists notwithstanding that the reasons for making the choice are rational, irrational, unknown, or even non-existent. So according to Lord Donaldson's ruling, our uh, uh, anorexic patient here, uh, unless we can say they don't have capacity, we have no right at all to uh, force feed the patient. But force feeding does occur uh, uh, um, uh, with anorexic patients. It's a last resort and every other avenue is explored before that, but it does exist. Uh, and on what grounds it exists is very straight, straightforward here. Uh, it's, it's basically on the, on the uh, uh, basis that the patient does not have capacity because they are suffering from a mental disorder which distorts their capacity. And that if they did not have this mental health issue of anorexia nervosa, they would understand their capacity would be that it was in their best interest to eat. And so when, when this uh, occurs, force feeding occurs in anorexia, it is only on the basis of lack of capacity. And it can only be on the basis of lack of capacity because according to the principle of autonomy, if capacity exists, then uh, the decision not to eat, irrational or not, uh, has to be, uh, uh, be uh, honoured by the healthcare professionals. Uh, and, and as we've written here, force feeding could be described as a paternalistic intervention designed to facilitate further treatment with the intention of resurrecting the ability to make authentically autonomous decisions. So in other words, what that means is that we will, uh, on the basis that the patient currently lacks capacity, force feed them until they are better uh, and that their capacity returns, much like we would treat the unconscious patient who can't give their view sensibly until they regain consciousness and they regain capacity. So that is the, the basis of force feeding anorexic patients. So uh, uh, the, the idea of autonomy uh, is treasured, it's clear, and it is sacrosanct in the uh, secular Western world. Uh, if you transgress the concept of autonomy, you do so at your peril uh, because it is sacrosanct and precious. So with that in mind, uh, I'm gonna read out for you a couple of cases. And then I'm gonna uh, ask you, I'm gonna split you up into groups. They won't be the same groups as last week because the, uh, the breakout rooms are randomly uh, allocated. Uh, and uh, I don't mind which of these two cases you discuss. Uh, but I want you to try and think about the ideas that we've put forward uh, and the, the um, sort of questions that I've given you there to think about. Uh, and they're both cases which uh, speak about, in one way or another, they speak about autonomy, but they're not straightforward. So um, before I go on to those cases, uh, is there uh, anybody who has a burning question to ask about what we've said so far about the Western uh, uh, secular concept of autonomy. Yes, uh, Stephen, I can see Stephen Schaffer with his hand up. You'll have to unmute. Yeah, I mean, the overriding factor, surely, of autonomy is, is it within the law of the country? I'm thinking of euthanasia, which doesn't seem to have come into what you said. Okay, so euthanasia, we are going to discuss um, at a, uh, another session when we discuss uh, that in some detail. You're right that uh, um, the law of the land has to be uh, a part of this. Um, you can't, somebody has an autonomous decision uh, to say, I insist that you shoot me through the head, then uh, you can't do that. So yes, that, that is true. That is a given that we're not breaking any laws. Okay, anybody else with a burning question that can't wait to the end? 
Um, let's speak yes. now. Um, now. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, to Who determine, to de um, Hilary Raymond. Oh, Hilary, there you are, okay. To, to determine mental capacity where let's say someone suffering from anorexia is concerned, let's say it's got to the stage where somebody is likely to die if they are not uh, given treatment, would one consider uh, mental capacity being, if you ask that patient, is it your intention to die or just to lose weight, to be thin? Surely if it's just to be thin, you have to assume a different answer to that if they say, well, they don't care if they die. Okay, that's a fair question. And the issue of capacity um, is one which uh, there are strict rules about, and that is there are, uh, there are guidelines as to who, and who has and who doesn't have capacity, and those decisions are made by qualified uh, doctors, psychiatrists who have special uh, training in assessing capacity, and there are strict uh, um, rules and guidelines that they must uh, adhere to. In the same way, if you think about it, as if we're thinking about brain death, uh, you can't just walk in and say, oh, I think you're brain dead. Um, you are, there are strict rules or a criteria called the Harvard criteria that have to be adhered to. And it's the same with capacity. You can't just walk in and say, I think you're nuts and you don't have capacity. Uh, there are, there are uh, um, assessments that have to be made by uh, qualified people um, who are recognised as being experts in, their, in, in that uh, assessment. Yes, Howard. Are you suggesting that uh, two such qualified doctors would make a decision against the patient's expressed will without having the patient sectioned? under the Mental Health Act? Uh, um, uh, part of the, the Mental Health Act is often used as part of that uh, uh, process of, uh, of enforcing treatment. That's, that's part of the, uh, of the process. Thank you. Well, yeah. thank you. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's move on then to our cases. Um, case one uh, is a woman enters the emergency room with stomach pain. She undergoes a CT scan and is diagnosed with abdominal aortic aneurysm. That is a, uh, a weakening in the wall of the aorta, which causes it to stretch and bulge like a balloon. And if it pops, you've basically had it. Uh, the, phys the physicians inform her that the only way to fix this problem is surgically, and that the chances of survival are about 50-50. They also inform her that time is of the essence, and should the aneurysm burst, she will be dead in a few short minutes. The woman is an erotic dancer. She worries that the surgery will leave a scar that will negatively affect her work. Therefore, she refuses any surgical treatment. Even after much pressuring from the physicians, she adamantly refuses surgery, feeling that the woman is not in her correct state of mind and knowing that the time is of the essence, the surgeons decide to perform the procedure without consent. They anesthetize her and surgically repair the aneurysm. She survives and sues the hospital for loss of earnings. Okay, that's our first case. And there's some questions for you. You can read them yourself. And the second case is slightly different. You are a general practitioner and a mother comes into your office with a child who's complaining of flu-like symptoms. You ask the boy to remove his shirt and you notice a distinct pattern of bruises. You ask the mother where the bruises come from and she tells you they're from a procedure she, pour, she performed on him known as chai jio, which is also known as coining. The procedure involves rubbing warm oils or gels on a person's skin with a coin or other flat metal object. And the mother explains that this is used to raise out bad blood and improve circulation and healing. When you touch the boy's back, he winces in pain from the bruises. You debate whether or not you should call the child protection services and report the mother. And I've given you some questions there. Uh, and I particularly want you to consider the last, those of you who are gonna do that um, case. I want you to look carefully at, at all of those questions, but especially the last one. What if this was a procedure described by the rabbis in Jewish books? Okay, I'm going to break you out into your rooms. Um, I hope that I'm going to do this correctly now. Um, so I'm going to assign automatically. How many people do we have? We have 49, 50 computers. 
So I'm going to create uh, 10 rooms. So most of you should have uh, five. Some of you may have four uh, people in your rooms. So here you go. You will have to accept the rooms, join your rooms, um, and then uh, I will pop in and speak to you as we go along. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Hello. Johnny, can you hear me? I can hear you, Simon. I don't know if anyone else can. Uh, are, uh, are you in a room? I think so, with uh, Rochelle Epstein, Naomi West, uh, and you. Oh, I see. Oh, and, okay. and Diane Jezurin. Okay. Um, let, let me move that out of the way. Uh, I'm you. Okay, I'm you. I can see that. Naomi, can you hear us? Uh, doesn't look like it. Diane, can you hear us? 22,885 new cases. 22,885 um, new cases today. Elisheva, can you hear us? How are you? No, that's very strange. Okay. Um, um, ah, there's Ellie Sheva. Can you hear us? Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, <laughs> Ellie Sheva. Right. Naomi, can you hear us? Can you un Naomi, can you unmute yourself? More irritation. I want to scratch it. Naomi, we can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Naomi, can you un unmute oh, yourself? You. <laughs> no, okay. Well, you'll just have to lip read Naomi. Right. <laughs> and Simon, um, you can choose which case you're going to discuss, um, and I'll uh, I'll split in and out. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Naomi, can you hear me? Hi, Naomi. No. Eddie Sheva, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, hi, good evening. Uh, uh, you've got my name now. I'm speaking from Manchester. Um, uh, you have uh, Jonathan Lieberman's name against your... That's because she's my wife. Ah. What's worth it, Shirley? That's another senior moment on my part. But there we are. Ellie, not nice to meet you. Um, I, I, I'd like to join to have Naomi join in as well, but I'm not quite sure. No, Naomi, can you hear us? Naomi West, can you hear us? You, I tell you what, Simon, you and Ellie Sheva discuss one of the cases. I'll write a little message to her and see if I can. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you. Ellie Sheva, I didn't have the pleasure of meeting you. I, I, uh, f from uh, memory whilst you were still in Manchester, but uh, nice to catch up with you. Um, and your husband is doing wonders at the moment with these, uh, with this course and other presentations he's given. So Kola uh for all your support for him. Um, and probably in your own right as well. Um, moving on to, 
do you have a preference as to uh, whether you wish to discuss case one or case two? I know less about case two scenario than I would about, I know from practice about case one, um, but I, I, I'm on uh, unfamiliar ground probably for case two. Right. And so you might be able to help me out with that. I don't know. Um, um, I really do, I don't have, uh, I, I, it would be a story, wouldn't it? I, I missed that. And then he had the camera Right, I just muted, muted everyone because there was a bit of background. So can everybody in your rooms unmute yourself again? What for your stomach? Yeah. Elisheva, unmute yourself again. Yeah, that's for your stomach. This is the heart. Yeah, right. Like a, um, the other thing. Sorry. Diane, can you hear us? Um, where I had to. Yes, I can. Sorry, I was having a lot of computer problems. So I hope this will work better now. Diane, can, you can hear us now? Yes. Okay. Right, Simon, I'm going to make a decision for you because we're running out of time. I would like you three to discuss uh, case number one. The oh, Jerry's joined us now. Uh, Jerry, unmute yourself, please. And she'll call it here. Case number one. Uh, case number one. The, Fine. The erotic, the erotic dancer. Um, the questions on the uh, sheet uh, were basically. Is it justified? Is there any justification for going against this woman's wishes and doing this operation? Forget the fact that it would be difficult to actually anesthetize her against the will. Let's just forget the, 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 the physical difficulty of it. We're talking about the, uh, the idea of it. So do you believe that the physician's actions can be justified? What else could they have done? Um, and what do you think the halakha would say? Now, that's your uh, challenge to discuss over the next 10 minutes. And I am just going to pop out and look at somebody else right now. Thank you. Jerry, can you hear? Yes. Hi, I'm Simon Nelson from speaking from Manchester. And Diane, can you hear? Yes. Hi. I don't know if Naomi, Naomi is still uh, muted. <clears throat> so it may have to be in the, the four of us for the time being with Elisheva as well. Um, I can only deal with it from, from my uh, previous professional perspective of uh, a lawyer many years ago uh, and more recently uh, a coroner. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear from, from the others as to their views before I might uh, uh, volunteer mine, if, if you wish. Uh, the first question being as to whether or not the physician's actions can be justified uh, in any way. I don't know if anyone wants to uh, present a view. Well, she, she, seems, she seems to have good capacity um, to make the decision herself um, to not go through a serious operation and to, um, to lose her ability to, to earn a living. Um, I've not had any knowledge now. That's all I can do, really. I mean, it's a major, major operation oh, yes. that could go wrong as well. But uh, certainly under the Lord Donaldson definition uh, of capacity, as long as she has no mental incapacity, uh, she may be neurotic as well as uro uh, erotic, um, but ir irrespective. Um, she seems to have capacity, as you say. I don't know if uh, Naomi agrees with that. Well, Naomi perhaps uh, can't uh, voice her views, but Jerry or Diane, do you agree that she has capacity? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I don't have the case in front of me. Ah, I just this is, well, very briefly, this was a lady who was an erotic dancer who uh, had diagnosed the fact that she had uh, an abdom abdominal aortic aneurysm. The, the main vessel going down the, the, the front know, of the body is, is the... Right. Uh, so mm -hmm. an aortic aneurysm. She's told that she needs surgery, the survival chances of which are 50-50. Uh, 
uh, and they tell her that time is of the essence and she refuses surgical treatment on the basis that any surgical scar would impede her future career as an erotic dancer. Uh, but nonetheless, the physicians uh, take the view that she's not in a correct state of mind, and because time was of the essence, they decide to perform this procedure without consent and proceed to anaesthetize her and repair, and she subsequently survives and sues the hospital for loss of earnings. It sounds like a typical case in the United States, but uh, perhaps not in the, well, in the UK. I don't think they have the right to tell her what to do with her body. Uh, you know. I'll give my background, and I'm a, a family doctor from the Netherlands. Right. And, but I live and work now in, in, in Israel. Uh -huh. the, way, the way I've been trained, it would absolutely not be allowed and there, were, there would not be a, any surgeon who would operate her against her will um, for something like this. In English law, it would be an assault and battery, in fact. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Elisheva, do you want to say anything? Do you, do you want? I, I'm not quite sure. I'm quite happy not to... Uh, 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 convene or, or uh, uh, to ask others if, if you, by all means do say if you want to express a view. Elisha, you, you agree with that? No. No. I definitely agree with that. You know, she obviously has capacity to think it through and um, on her would be, would be I'm sure, um, not much. Um, yeah, I think we're all agreed on that then. Yes. Uh, is there anything else they could have done? Is the second question. The difficulty is, I suppose, time is of the essence here. They could. They could have continued discussing with her about, you know, that the um, what the options were with with the um, with the um, scar. Um, Whatever. I mean, they could still try to talk her into it, but but not without her permission. And anyone else have a contrary view? Yeah. Jerry or Rochelle? Uh, Rochelle. Sorry, I, I was supposed thank to you for be joining us. Free, and my computer went kaput, and I'm back on. I've got into the wrong room. But you, you're more than it's not not the wrong room. It's maybe the right room. Uh, <laughs> but you're welcome to join us. Uh, um, have you got case one before you? No, I was, uh, I was, we were doing case two, but um, I'll go and ah. go and look at it. All right, I know what it is anyway. Go on. Uh, <laughs> um, apart from Naomi, who hasn't expressed a view, uh, I think the, we're unanimous in that the physician's actions can't be justified. It's contrary to the patient's consent here. They haven't obtained valid consent. So I, I think we agree on that. And so the second question was, any, is there anything else they could have done? I think maybe uh, if I put my two penny worth in, em emphasise that it would, would definitely burst at some time. It would certainly, certainly erupt at some point and she would die. More yes. emphasis on that, I think. Um, so yeah. Are you coming at this? Are you coming at this from a professional perspective? Uh, Semi, I, I was the... I was a practice nurse for Johnny for 31 years. And that, that, that's ex excellent experience, I'm sure. <laughs> um, anyone else have a view on question two? I would, but they can move back. Um, it, yeah. it, it seems that they've done all their, their duty in um, t talking about the risks and talking about... Um, everything that it entails. I don't think it changes anything by, um, you know, it still looks to me clear cut that they've done the explaining, she's got capacity, and she's made a decision. Yeah. Anyone want to add to that? No. On third question, is it ever right to take away someone's autonomy? Would a court order make the physician's decision ethical in retrospect as such? Jerry, do you want to come in on that? I can't think of a case that would be okay, but maybe there is a case. Of the 
the problem probably with this particular example is, is the urgency of the situation. Uh, the time time is, yeah. is such that they wouldn't have time to go to get a court order. No, there's no time to for a court. Maybe not. Well, there is. Uh, you don't know. You don't know whether whether there, whether the, there is or not. Um, she has had the, the aneurysm doesn't form itself in five minutes. Um, sure. So, I mean, it depends on what your alternatives are, but she, it, it isn't, a, it, it's a, a bomb ticking, but you don't really know for how long it will be ticking. And if she refuses, she will die. And if she, and if you get, you, you would get a court order, then maybe she would not die in the meantime. So it, 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 would that represent the clinician's only alternative course of action? I guess, but I, I don't think there is a basis for a court order. No, I agree. I agree. Anyone else want so to contribute? I mean, that's a different a different issue, whether there is a sure. basis for a court order or whether there is time for a court order. Yes, there is time, but there is no basis. But pe plenty of people go to court without there being any basis at all for the action. Okay, well, so... <laughs> yeah. I don't think the trust will be very happy with, with the misuse of funds necessarily, but uh, yeah. that's another question. <laughs> Jerry, do you want to come back on that at all? Well, Shava? No? Well, I mean, we're assuming that you tried to talk her into it and she didn't, she wouldn't go along, is that it? Is that what you're assuming, that you tried to uh, talk her into doing the operation, but she, uh, she wouldn't yeah. go along? All right, well, she, if you could get her to sign something, I guess you could go ahead with it. But if she wouldn't agree, I don't think... No, she's not going to... It says here she won't agree. So moving on to the fourth question, if you were one of the health workers, and I've never been in this position, but if you were one of the health workers, what would you do? I'm trying to sway to have it done. <laughs> I would talk and talk and talk and try to involve her family if she has family. Um, Yes. Yeah. But uh, I mean that she really realizes what her what her options are. Um, yeah, whether she prefers to to be a, a dancer or dying, you know, it's. Yeah. But if she, she's not going to get to dance if she's going to no. die anyway. No. Okay, <laughs> but she might prefer dying than than yeah. not being a dancer. Not yeah. But to dance. Not being a dancer. So that's her choice then. Fair enough. Yeah. But she has to realize that that's her choice. Yeah. Right. Okay, moving on to the final question then. And I'll defer to any or all of you here uh, as to the Jewish perspective. Because I've never same. thought of it in halachic terms. Not the same. I don't Can think. any of you assist here? I don't really know. Uh, you know, like... Um, you want to go back to the beginning? Uh, but I think that I think that from a Jewish perspective, more um, more things are allowed against her will. Yeah, but I'm not what, sure. What uh, to to hold her down, and and that'll be an assault as well, effectively to hold her down and force her to have the uh, the anesthetic. Uh, uh, not, you don't need to hold her down. You give her some dormicum and she <laughs> uh, whatever against her will. I'd be interested to hear the that, halakha perspective. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, but so I think that the halakha will, will force people more than the secular. Yeah, definitely. To what extent, I don't know. Right, we'll have to wait for uh, uh, Jonathan's uh, Yeah, uh, well, I know here. that I worked in, in Laniado, and there was a different case that someone had his, his foot. Uh, and Laniado is a religious hospital, right? So, yes. here just, so here there is a guy that he his, his it just, and you know, he didn't the want. And then yeah, they yeah, got um, their children to sign that they like did want. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so then the father's foot did get amputated. So I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. A, religious family, a very religious family. I don't. I don't know exactly what happened there, but I know that this is what happened. That against the father's will, the the foot did get amputated. Right. Um, I I can't really add to it. Um, I I we were once involved in a case where 
a man refused to have his, he was a diabetic and he'd had a couple of amputations on the same leg and um, they wanted to do some more amputations higher up and he refused and halakhically he was right, he was allowed to refuse because the outcome would have meant prolonging his life but being a miserable life um, mm. because he would lose the capacity to, to walk and move around. And therefore, um, he had that right, halakhically, to not go through another massive operation um, to um, maybe not even enhance his life at all. Because it wasn't psigratia. Yeah. I would be very surprised if that's the halakhic point of view, but we'll hear soon enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There may be more than one halakhic opinion, of course. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> depends on the situation. Hi, my apologies. I joined you late. Then, yeah. What are you oh. discussing now? We've discussed case one. Um, by all means, if you've got the uh, uh, case the one. case in front of you, by all means, go through all, uh, go through the five bullet points, uh, and more than happy to hear if you differ from any of the views that we've expressed but i think we're well, fairly I unanimous the, i haven't from... heard the views that you've uh, expressed i have uh, my own opinion about it we don't um, i think correct me if i'm wrong but i, I don't believe that uh, anyone is saying that the physician's actions can be justified on what we've read is there anything else that could be done well perhaps persuade uh, the patient uh, use greater for, uh, greater persuasive efforts or have family intervene to try and persuade the patient. Um, possibly an application to the court if there was sufficient time, uh, even if that application might be completely baseless. Um, fourth point, what would you do if uh, we were one of the healthcare work workers is, is just emphasize the, uh, the benefits of undergoing surgery um, because she wouldn't uh, if, if she if she's uh, if she's deceased she wouldn't be able to of course uh, continue with her profession uh, and I don't think any of us is able to profess the halachic view. Okay well uh, number one as far as I'm concerned so good I've got a chance to uh, disagree with most of you. Uh, number one the physician's actions can be totally justified uh, from the point of view of halacha um, and also from the point of view of practicality, uh, the odds are um, that there's a... Well, you see, they will be worried in that area. I can understand. Uh, that there's a whole horrible racket coming through, um, but I'll try um, again and get above it. I think, number one, the physician's actions can be uh, totally justified um, on the basis that uh, there is no um, uh, other alternative. That condition, an um, aortic aneurysm that is uh, actually separating, just uh, dissecting, uh, there's no time to go to court. It's a matter of life and uh, death. Um, if it's, nothing's done about it, the chances of her dying are um, extremely high in a short space of time. If something is done about it, she can be saved. Um, and I believe, I believe that according to Halacha, that uh, that's going to be actually um, the uh, opinion. Al Allah, um, I don't think, will allow somebody in this respect to take the choice of uh, taking their own life. Um, and in terms of the, in terms of, I, I don't think that the issue is her profession, by the way. Um, no, I agree. I think that that is just a cover. That's a cover and not being able to be an erotic dancer. It's a message actually for something else. And the message is that um, having the surgery, um, and let's hope surviving it, having the surgery and surviving it, uh, yes, it's going to leave her actually with huge scars that, uh, okay, she won't be able to be an exotic dancer, but I don't think that that's the issue. The issue, I think, is that she, in her mind at least, probably having heard from others and seen pictures, she is going to be so disfigured that not that she can't do anything else in life, but that no man, in her mind, no man is ever going to want her. And unless, unless, and it doesn't say here that she's a Haredi woman 
or a religious Muslim who's going to be totally covered up until the moment uh, in which she uh, gets into bed with her um, uh, arranged husband to be, if she's going to be um, carrying on a sort of normal life, and especially as an exotic dancer um, from the past, uh, going to bed um, when she uh, gets into a relationship with a guy, uh, she's not, because as far as she's concerned, her mental image of herself Whatever anybody tells her from the outside, you're still a beautiful woman, etc. She's going to look herself in the mirror and she's going to see this horrible scarring because there's no way around it. I don't know of any modern surgery that gets around repairing an aortic aneurysm without huge um, uh, scarring um, being left. Most people would be happy that they survived. But she, um, uh, because she has made the most of her body, and for as far as she's concerned, her body is everything. So uh, she's going to be um, imagining, in her mind at least, that no man on the face of the earth and the open. Okay. Yes, I've been faced with that issue um, when I was uh, doing my uh, psychiatric training. I was faced with the issue, and that is uh, the application for mental health. The application to uh, decide that she is disturbed, mentally disturbed, and so she can't make the decision on her own. And therefore, the medical care workers will make the decision for her. Now, when I was a resident in training in psychiatry, I actually was faced with that, and I said, no, there is nothing else other than the fact that she doesn't want your treatment. But it wasn't quite as life and death a matter as this is. In a life and death matter as this is, and I, I, I probably say, yeah, sure, uh, go ahead and uh, let her sue afterwards. Let her sue, but at least she'll be alive and, and to go through with a lawsuit. There you are. Why, why do we want so badly for her to be alive? For okay, everybody. Um, sorry to have to break up the parties like that. The ones that I joined uh, were certainly uh, uh, getting some good discussions in there. Um, I, I'm hoping that you can see my screen uh, on here. Uh, which says some writing that says autonomy, the halachic view. Can you see that? Yes. On the screen, give me, yeah. Okay, good. All yes, right. But but I was I was on mute before and I would like to ask Mr. Berger something. Okay, go ahead. Why would we want so badly to, for her, to keep her alive when she doesn't want to be kept alive? No, you're on mute also. Doesn't it doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that if you do something that actually saves their life that afterwards they're not very grateful um we had uh, okay, an interesting annoyed. we had an interesting discussion um about this in terms of uh, soldiers um uh, soldiers especially um khayalim uh, um uh, uh, um Whatever the word is, there be dim, not not be not the same. Bodhidim, dim, sorry, dim, bodhidim, dim, and some of whom have been uh, either threatening or committing suicide. Um, actually, a colleague of mine did an article about this some years ago regarding soldiers in the Israeli army, uh, some who, of whom had committed suicide. Uh, a neighbor of his had two sons who were in the army committed suicide. Uh, the issue there what led to writing the paper was that the psychologists, when these young people came, said, oh, it's your choice. You, know, you can, just, if you don't want to live, it's your choice. And uh, my colleague That's and his father were furious and said, what are you talking about? And the thing is that there, those soldiers who did not go through with it and remained alive a few months later said, oh, I must have been nuts because I'm happy now. I'm out of the basic training, which was horrible, and the nastiness and the bullying and everything. And now life is okay and life is good. And I see all the good things that I must have been nuts to think of killing myself. So many people afterwards actually are grateful that, in fact, that they're not dead. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to uh, cut that discussion short for the moment because uh, we've still got uh, to get through some uh, halakha. 
Um, and uh, so I want to get straight to that. Um, uh, and, um, and when we've finished, when I've gone through this, uh, then I will open it up for questions and as long as you want to stay. So um, please bear with me until we've gone through this, because this is really very important. So as I said to you right at the beginning, we're going to find some difficulties now here in Halakha, because the Halakha does not accept the basic premise of autonomy. That is the bottom line, folks. And I could stop here and you would all say, oh, well, OK, I don't I don't I, I don't get this Halakha because that's not in in keeping with my Western views. Um, so we need to go into it a little bit more detail. But the bottom line is, uh, as I've written here, by the way, what is on you see on the screen here, um, uh, Avril will send out to you. Oh, hang on. Um, somebody is waving at me that you can't see it. OK, no. can anybody see it on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. So somebody can't, then it must be your screen because most of you can. Let me stop the share. And I'll reshare and see if that helps. Hang on a second. How about now? Any better? Yes? Okay, good. Right. So um, it's very small. It's it's very small print, and I have my glasses on. It's okay. So. Uh, Right, let me see if I can make it bigger. Open it up with your own fingers. It'll open up bigger with your own fingers. Not on if it's not on, it's not a touch screen, Hillary. Oh, sorry. If you go to, if you go to Zoom, oh, you are yeah, doing, go to Zoom. doing that. Make it there we go. How better. about that? Yeah, that's better. You can even make it 200. No, I won't, I won't be able to read it myself then. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, there we go. Just a little so, bit, a little bit. Basically, uh, uh, you'll get this sent to you by uh, email when uh, when I send you the recording anyway. So um, you will you will have this in writing for yourself to print out or to keep on your computer. So basically, the idea in Jewish uh, thought in halacha is one's body is not one's own property, but is on loan from Hashem. We do not have autonomy over our body and we do not have any kind of rulership over the bodies of others. And um, this is basically uh, uh, brought through in the Rambam. Rambam, Maimonides, uh, rules that one who commits suicide is guilty of murder. You've murdered yourself and will be held accountable in the heavenly court. In the, uh, in the um, human court, of course, you can't be tried for murder because you're dead. Uh, but in the heavenly court, you will have to account for your actions. And according to the Rambam, uh, in, in Hilchus Rotzeh, Choshmeret HaNefesh, uh, one who commits suicide is guilty of murder. And the, uh, I brought you here the, the Rambam in, in English and in Hebrew. It's based on a uh, pasuk in Bamidbar, uh, do not accept ransom for the soul of a murderer uh, um, uh, because uh, the idea is that if there is a murderer in court and the uh, murderer says, I will pay a million pounds not to be executed, then the court cannot accept that ransom money because uh, the Rambam says the rationale is that the soul of the victim is not the property of the blood redeemer, but the property of Hashem. And therefore, uh, you cannot do that. So the basic concept of this is that our bodies are not ours to do as we wish with them. So all of the things that we have said uh, hitherto, before we broke out into our rooms, in that uh, the autonomy of somebody is sacrosanct, and that they can do whatever they want. And Lord Donaldson's ruling that says you can do what you want, however bonkers you are, as long as you're not bonkers enough not to have mental capacity, that goes out of the window as far as the basis of halacha is concerned. So we've also got some psukim in the Torah. There will be a very well-known pasuk in uh, uh, Sefer Dvarim, chapter 4, verse 15, 
You'll have heard this quoted many times. And you shall guard very much your souls. And this is interpreted that nafshotechem also applies not only to your souls, but to your bodies. And therefore, uh, you are enjoined not to do anything which is uh, of danger to your body. This, by the way, is the basis of the halacha. And it is a halacha that says it is forbidden, according to Jewish law, to smoke. Because everybody in the planet now knows that smoking is bad for you. So, means that you are not allowed to smoke. It means that you have an obligation. You have a Torah obligation to look after your body and to, uh, um, to do whatever it takes to be uh, cured. Furthermore, there's a Pasuk in uh, Sefer Vayikra, which you will be very familiar with as well. And you shall keep my laws and statutes, and they shall be done. And the person, you shall live by them. And the commentators say, yes, you shall live by them and not die by them. This is the uh, origin and the source of the halacha, the pikuach nefesh. The uh, uh, saving life is doche et hakol. It pushes away everything. The, uh, the, the, uh, um, the saving of a person's life pushes away everything else. So v'chai bahem, you shall have to live by them. So therefore, not only is a physician obligated to heal, that's another uh, uh, part of uh, medical ethics that a doctor who is a qualified doctor has an obligation to heal. We might talk about that in a later session. But the patient is obligated to seek healing to the extent that refusing life-saving treatment has been morally equated with suicide. So uh, the, uh, our erotic dancer who uh, uh, refused treatment, if she didn't have treatment and the, uh, the aneurysm were to burst and she were to die, alpi uh, alacha, she would be considered to have committed suicide. So it follows, therefore, that the halakha does not acknowledge personal autonomy in the contemporary sense of the word. But that doesn't mean that a patient may never refuse treatment. There are nuances, there are uh, qualifications, and it's not a blanket refusal. And this is why it's so important to understand the halakha, to read the, the various commentators, to understand the concept of halakha and the concept of Jewish, uh, the Jewish approach to, to medicine in order to come to halakhically correct decisions. Um, so let's just take a, a quick whiz through a bit of history uh, of the halakha of refusing treatment. And um, the Radvaz, uh, Harav David ben Shlomo ibn Abi Zimra, from the 16th century, he discusses a question which is a very contemporary question. And uh, I know for sure that there are some people in this session who will recognize the case that the, the Radvaz talked about as being a case which we had and that I was involved with in Manchester a number of years ago. And this is the case of the Radvaz. There was somebody who in a misguided act of piety refused to desecrate the Shabbat to procure life-saving treatment. In other words, the person needed to do something which was forbidden to do in the normal circumstances on Shabbat, said, no, it's Shabbat, I can't do this, didn't do it, and died as a result of misguided piety. And in a strongly worded response, the Radvaz in the 16th century condemned the behavior as the opposite of piety and ruled that the person must be forced to accept the treatment by any means available, even pouring it down his throat if so needed. It is likewise written in the Shulchan Aruch that if, a, if doctors disagree as to whether Shabbat must be desecrated to save a patient's life, 
we err on the side of desecrating the Shabbat. In other words, we don't take any chances. There was a case, a very tragic case in Manchester a few years ago that I was involved in, where a patient misguidedly refused to test his blood on Shabbat because uh, it was not allowed and he was diabetic. Cut a long story short, tragically this man died 10, 20 years maybe before his time uh, because he would not test his blood on Shabbat. Uh, that was misguided piety. And the Radvaz spoke about that already in the 16th century. This is the, uh, in red here that I've, uh, I've written out for you, I'm not gonna read it now, but when you get it, you'll be able to read it for yourself. This is the Shulchan Aruch itself, uh, speaking about uh, uh, the, the idea, every illness uh, uh, that the doctors say is dangerous, uh, you desecrate the Shabbos for it. And this is the concept of v'chai bohem. So in the event that the patient refuses treatment, Halacha mandates that he be forced to accept the treatment against his will. That is the Magen Avraham, 17th century, uh, speaking uh, about the Shulchan Aruch. Now you could say, well, okay, that case is different because that is a case of misguided piety. And if we could say to this person, and if we could get through to him, and he would understand that this was not the correct thing to do religiously, uh, that he would accept the treatment. And the only reason that he was so insistent uh, on not accepting the treatment um, would be because uh, he thought that was the right thing to do al pi halacha. But what would we do? Would we be equally insistent if the patient's refusal was not because of misguided piety, but because of some other, perhaps more reasonable consideration. Now, the, uh, the Yaivetz, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, some of you may have heard of him, he uh, lived in the 18th century. He uh, discusses the Shulchan Aruch, which we've mentioned before, and he says that this Shulchan Aruch, which says that we uh, uh, force a patient to have the treatment, only applies uh, in the situation where this was to do with misguided piety. And if the patient has real misgivings and he really doesn't think that this treatment is um, going to work, however bonkers that might be, then he or she cannot be forced to accept the treatment. So in other words, the Yaivet, Rabbi Yaakov and Emden, is uh, already by the 18th century coming a little bit closer to the modern secular approach to, uh, uh, to uh, autonomy by saying that if the patient really believes that this treatment is bad, then you do not force them to have it. And this is the Yaivetz, I've quoted it here for you in red. Um, I'll read it to you um, because it's important. One who practices tested treatments definitely forces a recalcitrant patient in a case of danger to undergo any treatment licensed by the Torah in its permission to heal. And he gives some examples, even removing a limb to save his life. And we force him against his will to save his life. We do not pay attention to his refusal of pain and his choice of death over life. We even cut a whole limb if this is necessary to save him from death. But uh, then we do say, that uh, um, what we do say that is only in a case where there is no doubt that the treatment works. If there's any kind of dispute between the experts, then we cannot force the patients to do so. We can only, this is the Yaivetz, says we can only force a patient to undergo treatment when there is universal agreement amongst all the healthcare workers that this is the one and only treatment that is going to save the life. So um, you can see uh, that that's the Yaivetz. But then we come along to a little bit more contemporary halachic experts, and they uh, qualify this a little bit more even still. And in order to understand that, we need to understand the role of the doctor or the healthcare professional. 
So we understand that the patient is halachically mandated not to refuse treatment. We've said that the halacha says that you uh, do not have autonomy over your body. And all of those things so far. So um, why do we not allow the patient to exercise his free will? And so the simple answer is that there is uh, a, uh, uh, a halachic principle in uh, Sefer Vayikra, Lo ta'amod al dam re'echa. Do not stand by on the blood of your brother. In other words, if you see uh, somebody who is in a dangerous situation and you have the ability to do something to save them, you have an obligation to do so. Lo ta'amod al dam re'echa. Do not stand idly by by your brother's blood. There is also another principle that says that nobody's blood is redder than anybody else's. So if you're not allowed to stand idly by your brother's blood, in other words, if you are not allowed to see somebody else in a life-threatening situation and do nothing about it, then you're not allowed to see yourself in a life-threatening situation and do nothing about it. It is a Torah law. Re'echa includes yourself. There is another principle of arvut. Kol Yisrael arevim zelazeh. Every single person in Israel, every, person, every single person is responsible for one another. We are all in it together. So there you could say that there is a fundamental obligation on the healer to heal and a fundamental obligation on the sick to be healed. But Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who I'm sure I don't need to introduce to you, uh, probably the uh, most uh, well-known and well-respected uh, halachic uh, decisors of the 20th century, certainly in, in America, uh, he has a very uh, interesting approach and he, ha, you will see in his approach that there is already a, a, an encroachment, if you like, by uh, secular values. And he says, if the patient's refusal is born from their not considering the long-term implications of their refusal, then indeed the patient can be forced to accept the treatment. In other words, what he's saying is that if the person does not have the capacity to understand the consequences of their actions, in other words, if they don't consider or they're not able to consider the long-term implications of their refusal, in other words, if our erotic dancer doesn't understand that she might die from this aortic aneurysm, if she doesn't take that into account in making her decision, then the decision is not considered uh, a valid decision. And therefore, as it were, Rabbi Feinstein says, that patient is as if that patient doesn't have capacity because they haven't demonstrated capacity by considering the long-term implications. Um, so he also says like this, what about the presumed psychological toll upon the patients forced to accept treatment they do not want? Indeed, Rabbi Feinstein writes that a patient should never be forced to accept treatment if we suspect that the psychological effect of such coercion would produce more harm than good. Now, that is massive because uh, those of you who are, are familiar with the uh, Abortion Act in the UK of 1967 uh, will know that the uh, huge uh, loophole which uh, through which horse, cart and every other vehicle of transport can be driven through is the fact that if there is uh, deemed to be significant psychological uh, harm or harm either psychological or physical to the life of the mother then an abortion can be done and in every single case uh, that can be uh, applied and of course, what that means is in the UK, you have effectively abortion on demand, although not actually abortion on demand, effectively it is, because that is a catch-all. And what Rabbi Feinstein is saying here could be used as a catch-all, because if you 
uh, take, let's just put aside the, uh, the cases the, that like Dr. Berger talked about before, where they afterwards thank you very much for saving their life. But let's just put those aside. Those that would come back to you like our uh, uh, erotic dancer and say, you have caused me unknown, uh, uh, un unlimited damage here, either psychologically or physically by your actions. Uh, Rabbi Feinstein would say that in that situation, you may think, you may even decide that coercion would produce more harm than good. And that harm doesn't have to be physical harm. It can be psychological harm as well. And if there is a suspicion that that could happen, then we do not force the patient to have the treatment. So Rabbi Feinstein, in effect, opens up the gates to interpretation of the halacha in a way which is not so far away from secular uh, autonomy ideas that we sp spoke about at the beginning of the evening. Uh, here is the, uh, in red, uh, are the words in, uh, from Rabbi Feinstein's uh, uh, Teshuvah uh, in Hebrew and in English, which you can read in due course. And he also says another interesting uh, nuance. He says that if a patient refuses treatment because he doesn't trust his doctors and their recommendations, he cannot be forced to accept the treatment unless every attempt to find a doctor whom the patient trusts has failed and every available doctor in the vicinity unanimous, unanimous, unanimously agrees that the treatment is indicated. So again, there you have that uh, idea that it has to be totally unanimous, uh, which the earlier Mephorshim spoke about as well. Um, and then we go on to say even further, Rabbi Feinstein says that even in scenarios where the patient can be forced, in other words, even where we say the halacha is we coerce the patient to have the treatment. Even in that case, he says, that simply means we apply significant pressure and attempt to strong arm the patient into accepting the treatment in whatever way we can. However, he stopped short of saying that we physically force patients to have treatment. However, he says, to literally force someone against their will, to hold them down and force something down their throat, a competent adult cannot be treated in such a manner. Now, that is a massive step by Rabbi Feinstein uh, from away from the Shulchan Aruch's initial position. It's a, a, a step away from the Radvaz away from the Rambam and away from the Yaivitz. Rabbi Feinstein, as you can see here, is, is allowing almost a, a parallel uh, approach in halacha to that of secular autonomy. That's not to say that we just discard halacha and say halacha doesn't matter, we're only going to go with the secular uh, thoughts. What it means is that with the uh, knowledge of a Moshe Feinstein with the ability and the broad shoulders of a Moshe Feinstein, with the will of a Moshe Feinstein to find approaches within halacha, it is possible to even square a circle. And this is a, a, a very, very important point. We uh, uh, are very much lacking uh, uh, in my humble opinion, we are lacking a Moshe Feinstein and we're lacking a Shlomo Zalman Auerbach, who I'm going to come to just for the last five minutes of our presentation now. Uh, and we will see here. I'd like to just go through here with you a, uh, a, an application of this, which is a, a real application that was sent to Reb Shlomo Zalman Auerbach in blue here. A 50 year old man suffers from multiple complications of diabetes. He's blind and has had one of his legs amputated. He is now hospitalized with an infection of the remaining leg and the doctors unanimously, unanimously agree that if he does not have the remaining leg amputated, he will die. The patient adamantly refuses, preferring to die. Would Halakha sanction his request? This dilemma was posed to Reb Shlomo Zalman Auerbach, probably the other 
most well-known and senior Posek of the 20th century. He was more uh, prolific in Israel versus Rabbi Feinstein in America. But Rabbi, Sh Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach, definitely Premier League and top of it at that. This is his opinion. Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach said as follows. The proposed surgery will not cure his underlying condition. He will not improve the quality of his life as it was until now. On the contrary, it will condemn him to a life as a double amputee. And his underlying diabetes, with all the risks it poses, will remain a continuing source of morbidity. This is in addition to the fact that the amputation itself carries significant risks. Reb Shlomo Zalman Orbach rules that in the light of these considerations, the patient should not be forced to undergo the procedure against his will, and we should not even attempt to persuade the patient to change his mind. He qualifies this by saying that the more basic necessities, such as food and oxygen, must still be provided to the patient, even against his will. And we will discuss the idea of basic life necessities in a later session when we talk about uh, euthanasia. Uh, but this is a massive ruling by Reb Shlomo Zalman. Not only does he say that we don't force the patient to have this treatment, we also say that we don't even persuade him to change his mind because this is not a case uh, of a situation where we're curing an underlying illness. So Reb Shlomo Zalman and Reb Moshe Feinstein, the, the two greatest authorities of, well, of my lifetime, uh, for sure, have shown us a way of looking at halakha, which we might not have initially seen. And whereas right at the beginning of this session, I lulled you into a p position of thinking that halakha and modern society were totally and utterly at odds, uh, the conclusion is like this. We've seen that the halakhic value system does not acknowledge personal autonomy in the modern sense. In theory, therefore, a patient may not refuse treatment and treatment may even be forced upon him against his will. At the same time, we've seen that there are certain and many scenarios where we need not force the patient to accept treatment, such as if the patient has legitimate misgivings about the efficacy of the therapy, if there is concern that forcing treatment will cause more harm than good, either physical or psychological, and if the patient is fearful of the risks of a procedure and the inevitable quality of life decline that will follow. So what we have here is a very nuanced approach to the halakha, uh, something which is not obvious at first glance and not obvious at first glance at the, the uh, uh, um, classic sources. But when we come to the contemporary sources, we see the uh, ability of great men of halakha and great minds to be able to interpret the halakha in a way which is suitable for uh, a modern world and is not so dissimilar to the uh, uh, ultimate in practice uh, scenario of autonomy in the secular world, even though it does not, halakha does not shy away from the basis of an ishmatim odet nafshotechem velota amod al dam reecha we do have a responsibility for looking after ourselves we do have that uh, Torah law but the halakha is not entirely black and white so that concludes my presentation on uh, autonomy as a medical ethical principle um, I'm going to uh, uh, open it up to you now to uh, uh, for questions. In order that you aren't all shouting at once and I can't hear a thing, I will ask you please to press the, um, the raise hand icon and I will be able to see that Where's raise that? hand icon uh, and ask you to unmute. So please don't, I don't know where the raise hand is. until uh, invited to do so because otherwise we won't be able to hear anybody. So anybody who would like to make a contribution, please press the raise hand icon now. I don't know where it is. 
Okay, uh, Larry and Sharon have their hand up. Yes, Larry and Sharon. Uh, yes, as to the two hypotheticals that you gave us to discuss, how would Halacha uh, treat each of those? Okay, um, the, let's take the um, let's take the uh, erotic dancer, um, and let's have a look. The erotic dancer has uh, uh, misgivings about the treatment. Why? Because she thinks it's going to do more harm than good. She thinks that by having a great big scar on her belly, she's not going to be able to do her job. She's not going to be able to earn a living. She's going to be uh, uh, in a situation where she can't feed her children, perhaps. Uh, her psychological health is going to be very severely damaged. Uh, I think that uh, if you were, uh, I, I hesitate to uh, Paskan Halacha in the shoes of uh, Rab, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, but my interpretation of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein's uh, uh, shuva is that the erotic dancing uh, case, that there would not be grounds for forcing her to have that treatment. Uh, the second case is a much disagree. more difficult... Totally disagree. <laughs> Who's disagreeing? Me, Joseph Berger. Totally okay. disagree. <laughs> right, well, you can disagree in a moment because I'm just going to answer the question first and then I will let you disagree uh, in a moment. So I uh, just ask you to hold fire for a sec uh, and you're fully entitled to disagree, but just give me a second. Um, the second uh, case it is much more difficult because that involves a third party. Uh, and uh, of course, we need to uh, bear in mind uh, the potential harm that is being done to a third party. This is not a case where the, uh, the mother that herself is inflicting things on her own body. She's inflicting it on her, her child. And therefore, I think this, this case uh, is a much more difficult case. The difficulty for us, of course, is that it's very close to home with Brit Mila, um, uh, because the, uh, uh, the secular uh, view of Brit Mila is certainly not universally that it is a beneficial thing. Uh, and you could certainly uh, understand uh, certain people would say that Brit Mila would fall into the same category. So that particular case uh, takes more, needs more discussion and more thought. And I'm not going to uh, uh, give my view on that without qualifying it and we haven't got too much time for that. Before we go to Howard and Hillary, I'm just going to give uh, uh, Joseph Berger uh, an opportunity to completely and utterly disagree with me. Off you go. <laughs> okay, uh, very briefly, what I said in the discussion group is that this business about uh, not being able to work as an e exotic dancer, uh, I don't think is the real story. I think that's a cover for her fear that she won't be attractive to um, uh, any man on the planet in the future, uh, unless she is a, a Haredi a woman or an ultra-religious Muslim who will be totally covered up until she actually comes to um, be married. Uh, in the world that she lives in, she'd probably have relationships with um, many different men and that she's uh, actually terrified in terms of her appearance. And therefore, from the psychological point of view, I think that's something that could be um, uh, tackled over a period of time in terms of her fears of um, not being attractive and not being able to uh, have a man to uh, desire her and want her and um, taking away the emphasis uh, from her body. She's immature as an exotic dancer and moving it more in terms of her personality. So I think that uh, yeah, to rush in from that point of view um, and say that she shouldn't have a life-saving treatment, with, which is something that she needs immediately. Um, it can't be decided by a court. It can't be decided that's going to take a period of time. It has to be decided on the spot. And um, my view was uh, that I think that um, there would be um, a lot of uh, authorities. Um, and uh, as I wrote in my brief comment, uh, Rabbi Lieberman, I, I believe that you come from Manchester. Um, my guess is that uh, Dine Weiss would um, uh, totally uh, disagree with um, Rob Feinstein in terms of um, broaden, broadening the psychological aspects uh, too much. You can only go so far. Uh, I, I think you're probably right that Diane Weiss would uh, take that position. Diane Weiss uh, never missed an opportunity to take the most machmir position uh, that was possible. Uh, that is definitely exactly. true. Uh, 
um, and I, uh, I don't disagree with you that there would be halachic opinions that would say you have to jump in. Uh, I, um, uh, however, uh, I believe that if you look at Rab uh, Feinstein's uh, Chuvot, I think that he would be of the opinion that it would not be uh, um, correct uh, or necessary uh, to uh, intervene. So, uh, yeah, I, I take your point that there would certainly be people who would jump in and do that. OK, let's move on to another point. Um, uh, Hillary, I think, was first and then Howard. OK, we discussed the second case and I just wanted to say that uh, the last question, what if this was a procedure described by the rabbis in Jewish books? From what you're saying, it wouldn't have been described by the rabbis in Jewish books because they wouldn't write anything that would cause anyone to harm themselves or for anyone else to harm somebody else. Is well, what no, what I meant by that question was um, that uh, certainly they wouldn't have written something that they knowingly would harm. But let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of what I meant. Um, there is uh, uh, in, in uh, 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 many, many places in, in, no, not many places, there is in some places in Jewish writings, there are uh, um, uh, cures which are mentioned, um, which uh, people today still do. For example, there is uh, uh, a cure which is mentioned, I can't remember by whom now, but it's mentioned by the rabbis, that if a person has jaundice, you take a pigeon, and you put the pigeon on the chest of the jaundiced patient and the pigeon dies and the jaundice goes away and the patient lives. Now, that was said by the rabbis at a time when they honestly believed with the best medical knowledge of their time. Uh, let's say it was the Middle Ages. I don't remember exactly who it was that said it, but let's say it was the Middle Ages that that was accepted as a, uh, a recognized treatment. We but it's today, not harming the patient. It's harming it, the is, it, is, it is harming the patient because you're not giving him the proper treatment. You're giving him um, pigeons on the chest, which doesn't work. If they know uh, about any other treatment. No, no, that's right. But what I'm saying to you, Hillary, is this. What if a patient comes to you, uh, and this has happened to me, uh, oh. where a patient comes to me and it says, the Chazal say that if I put my pigeon on my jaundice chest, I will get better. So I'm not going to take your treatment. I'm not going to go to hospital and have my treatment for uh, hepatitis or whatever else I've got. All I'm going to do is go home and get myself a pigeon. Now, that is harmful as we know it today. So that's okay. what I meant by that. So you've okay. got something that the rabbis say. Now, this this case that, that I gave you here of this girl, uh, she presumably believes that her um, um, procedure that she's done on her son uh, is, you know, her rabbi or whatever it is that is, she's got it from, believes that it works. We in modern society would say that not only doesn't work, you're actually harming that child. So when I asked that question, it was to highlight the fact that there are uh, even in our, uh, amongst our people, there are uh, uh, procedures which are described by the rabbis, which could be harmful as we see it today. Mm -hmm. And how do we then approach this? Do we say to the patient, your beliefs are bonkers and I'm not allowing you to do it? Or do we say, OK, that's your belief. That's your belief. Uh, you, you've got autonomy to believe what you want. That was part of the uh, of the question. Uh, OK, Howard. Very quickly, we didn't discuss case two, but it looks to me like a clear case of Munchausen's um, disease by proxy. So um, that dispenses with that. But on the first one, you didn't give the uh, view under the laws of England and Wales, or indeed the culture that arises from the laws of England and Wales. And we were all convinced in room 10 that the exigencies of the uh, moment are so great, the urgency of the uh, facts as provided are so great that uh, there can, can be no doubt that she's going to be um, uh, given the surgery or 
she's going to have to submit to the surgery. However, hidden away in the sheet that you showed us, but which we didn't have beforehand, there was some mention of not being able to um, apply force in order to bring about the surgery, something along those lines. And indeed, I was thinking all the way through, what happens if somebody is violent about it? Is one doctor going to hold her down and give her chloroform while the other gives her uh, another uh, medicinal treatment to, to knock her out? So I think it's very, very difficult. There's no time to have her sectioned. So if she's really violently against it, she isn't going to get the surgery. But if she submits to it, I think it's totally excusable. The physician's actions are justified, justifiable because all they did was hand it over to the surgical team. I take all the facts as, um, uh, as uh, liter literally correct. I don't look behind them. I assume that the, the question is carefully framed. Um, is there anything else they could have done? I don't know who you are referring to whom you're referring there. Uh, is it ever right to take away someone's autonomy? Well, I think it's right here. So ever is satisfied by that. There isn't time for a court order. And if I were a healthcare worker, I take that to include the surgeons. And I yeah. think I've already justified, I don't think you're talking about the ambulance drivers. So um, I, I think uh, that they are fully justified and they can pass the buck because I'm sure that the hospital is insured. And I'm, uh, uh, I would have been amazed had the Jewish view not been that her, although you said it wasn't, not been that her life should be saved. Um, I'm disappointed to hear that Pekirek Nefesh doesn't apply in this case. Okay, um, let me, thank you for all that, Howard. Before I go to Nachum, who has his hand up, Avril Lynx was shaking her head there. So I would like to invite Avril to, uh, to counter what Howard has just said. Why it was were just, you shaking your head, Avril? Because we just, I discussed it in my, in my room with Jeff Marks and as lawyers, we, we would have taken it on on a no, no, no fee, no win, no fee basis, definitely Jeff and I. There's no question in English law you cannot uh, do the surgery and she would get substantial compensation for loss of earnings. That's just the legal point of view. Well, you might, you might have found yourself against Howard Epstein, who's also a lawyer. You in have England, to mitigate so. her loss, Avril. She might Sorry? get another job. She has to go and try and find another job. And if she gets one at the same rate or more, her claim is worth well, she would mitigate that, but, but presumably she can't do anything else. That's what we assumed. OK, so that, that's interesting. We have two British lawyers there who are taking uh, uh, opposite views, which is always very interesting. Just again, before I come, before I come to Nahum, uh, let me address... Uh, I can't address all of the points that Howard raised there because I can't remember them all. Uh, but uh, the ones that I'm going to address... Um, uh, I did say right at the beginning, forget the idea that sh she would have to be sat on to do this. Uh, the question of uh, her consenting um, is without a doubt, they would not uh, do that operation without her consent unless she was already unconscious. Uh, uh, somebody that I know was almost unconscious, bleeding to death. And they came with a clipboard and a pen and said, sign here uh, before they uh, went to take her down to theatre to save her life because she was bleeding to death. Uh, and they wouldn't have done it had she not signed here. She didn't have a clue what she was signing because she was half, half gone. But they definitely would not have done that in the UK. There would have been no way they would have done that without her consent. Um, unless she was already unconscious, in which case you're absolutely right. Once she's unconscious, she no longer has uh, uh, capacity. And then we, as the healthcare workers, step in in her best interest and we can then make that decision because she doesn't have capacity. But while she retains capacity, the UK law is that that would not take place. Let me go to uh, Nahum and then after that, Vidi. By the way, anybody that wants to... Uh, go and drop off, as it were. Uh, feel, don't feel obliged to stay. Uh, I'm happy to stay as long as anybody wants to talk, uh, but please don't feel obliged to do so. If you're enjoying it, hang on. If you're not, then go make a cup of tea. Nachum, uh, what would you like to tell us? You'll have to unmute, Nachum. I am, Nachum. I am, I am I unmuted. Um, I wanted to say that uh, you represent the medical establishment, 
and you've put a, a scalpel right into the heart of alternative medicine. You have dismissed a patient's desire to use homeopathic remedies, which most physicians think is just a bunch of nonsense. You, you put a, 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 a wet blanket on top of any of the nutritional ideas that people have published. You, you represent a, a group of individuals, physicians, who think that whatever they say is the only way to treat disease because that's the only thing they know. And I want to condemn that idea because it's not fair, it's not reasonable, it's not scientific, and your own queen takes homeopathic remedies and everybody knows it. <laughs> I am not. I am not aware that I have thrown a wet blanket on any of all, any of that. Uh, I uh, don't think that any of the things that I have said was anti homeopathy. I don't think any of the things that I've said is anti alternative medicine. Uh, in terms of our first uh, case, um, if you if there is a recognised homeopathic cure for uh, aortic uh, abdominal aneurysm that, for which there is evidence based that it works. I'd love to see it. Uh, no, there isn't, there isn't. Okay, so you know in that. What, in what way have That's I dismissed silly. it? Well, well, the idea that a group of physicians have the only answer to what someone has as an illness is just unfair and in some cases, well, you say no, but that's the way the world is. You, you, I don't think you, I, I, the, it may, that may be the way the world is, but I don't think that I have represented that. This, the same thing can apply to a bunch of homeopathic doctors. If you have somebody comes in uh, that, that wants a treatment for a condition and the treatment of all the homeopathic doctors say that treatment X is what you require and the patient says, I don't want uh, treatment X, and all your homeopathic doctors say, well, if you don't have it, you're gonna die, then it's the same question. It doesn't matter whether it's a, a, a conventional doctor or it's a homeopathic doctor or an alternative doctor. The principle remains the same. The principle is, does, does the patient have autonomy to refuse treatment, whatever that may be, or does the healthcare professional, whether that be a conventional doctor or an alternative practitioner, uh, or a witch doctor, makes no difference. Wh whichever is in the position of offering or imposing a treatment, uh, I make no distinction between them at all. Uh, and I would venture to say that the fact that you have interpreted my approach in that way is a reflection of your very defensive approach towards conventional medicine. Just because right. I have, just because That's I correct. have the title the title of doctor and I went to a medical school doesn't make me anti-alternative uh, anti uh, medicine. I think that just reflects your, your prejudices against uh, conventional medicine. Well, so right. call it, I wouldn't call it, but it's unfair to call it prejudice. Let's say that I have a different experience in the world than, than people like you, because you, you sound that you're much more open to other ideas. But I don't think that you are the, the classic example of physicians where I, where I come from. And no, most physicians that are practicing in communities are against anything except whatever the drug company puts out, whatever they went through in training, and that's it. Whatever they want to give you and do, that's what you get. And anything... Okay, so my, my presentation makes no, no uh, distinction between any branch of medicine, whether it be conventional, alternative, or anything else. Let okay, me that, okay, let me that's that okay. Clear. That's a disclaimer. Okay, sorry about that. Right, uh, Vidi, Vidi, well, you've been patiently waiting. Hi, Vidi, what have you got to say? No, it was just regarding the case of the AAA. Um, you actually mentioned it about once the patient goes unconscious, you can then forcibly do the procedure is that correct say that again v i missed the beginning say it again the case of the triple a yeah where we were saying that the patient has not consented to treatment but 
but once they go unconscious, despite their previous wishes acting in best interest, you can go ahead with the surgery? Uh, that's not quite so straightforward. That wasn't exactly what I said, because the, what you've described there, of course, is definitely a conflict. Because if you know that the patient's wishes and that's been recorded um, and, uh, uh, and then you've got a bit more difficulty. Uh, what I meant to say, if I didn't make it clear, I apologise, is that if the patient before the discussion had uh, been had, uh, and there was no indication uh, uh, that she would be so vehemently against it, if she, in other words, if she was brought in unconscious in that situation, then you would have a best interest decision to make, and it may well be that the doctors would make the decision to intervene because that was the only chance of saving her life. Um, the question then would be, uh, would she be able to turn around when she got better to sue them for loss of earnings? And the answer would probably be no. Uh, because she hadn't expressed her wishes. Had she expressed her wishes and then, and it was very clear that she had expressed her wishes and uh, she, didn't, uh, uh, she didn't revoke that and everybody was clear about that, and then she became unconscious and you dived in and did it, I think you would be in difficulties. But why? You're still acting in the best interest. And in that case, um, going off the halachic viewpoint that was showed earlier, you were saying when the patient doesn't have that ability, then you can go ahead with that. But Jonathan, we're talk, it's, if you render her unconscious, that's battery. No, I wasn't talking about rendering her unconscious. I was saying oh, she, but became, there was, she became unconscious no, from, her burst, yeah, from her burst aneurysm. No, not that well, then, yeah, then she died. Yeah, no, okay. I, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean that you render her unconscious with an anesthetic against her, which I meant that she became unconscious because of her first aneurysm. Right, and then that's it. She, well, she dies. Yeah, well, unless you operate, she dies, yeah. And even no. if you operate, she probably dies. I don't know how you can get on a heart-lung machine that fast. Crack yeah. open the, the chest and get on a heart-lung machine that fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. It, it, it's There's, not straightforward, that's right. With already 50%. If she consented, and so no. Yeah, yeah, no. The, the the death rate of operating on unconscious patients who have uh, got um, burst aortic aneurysms is uh, I don't know what it is, but I bet it's over ninety percent death. Um, can, can we can we give you some information on the second case? Yes, you, come you on. Must and what if this was a procedure described by the rabbis in Jewish books? Go on. And indeed, there is something very similar described right. by the rabbis in Jewish books. Apparently, the Rambam recommended and used cupping, and he used it on the lower back for patients suffering from hemorrhoids. <laughs> he also used it, um, and this is where I think somebody mentioned in our group, I think it might have been uh, Mrs. Spitzer, about the toy tambankis, which means it will be as helpful as cupping a corpse. Um, so we do know that the Rambam, obviously, as a physician, did practice cupping because that was the thing to do. But whether somebody and Nafum was um, making a case for alternative medicine, alternative medicine is fine unless you're causing damage. And in case two, you're causing damage, you're causing bruising, which in itself can end up with a kid being anemic and having real problems. Yeah, I think, I think it's a very interesting, Charlie, about the, the Rambam's uh, suggestion on cupping. Uh, I, I, uh, I think we have to accept in this case that we are not talking about a, um, about the, um, a, method of treatment which is recognized as an alternative as a as a efficacious alternative medicine for example we're not talking about acupuncture where uh, acupuncture is well recognized to be efficacious uh, we don't really know how it works but we know that it does work we're not talking about that here we're talking about pigeons on the chest right a, 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 a treatment which we know doesn't work um, so I think the, 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 the distinction between that has to be made. Um, somebody had their hand up. It's Elaine. Yes, Elaine. 
Hi, I just wanted to know, uh, because I've heard a lot about the English point of view and what happens in the UK. What I want to know is, are these, uh, have you researched, do the Israeli hospitals go by halachic law? Okay, now I, I haven't researched Israeli law uh, because uh, it's hard enough knowing the stuff that I already know. Uh, and Israeli law is uh, obviously uh, a bit of a minefield for me. Uh, however, uh, I do know that the hospitals such as Shari Tzedek and Laniado have halakhi... No, I don't mean them. I mean mainstream Israeli. Um, it's I, obvious what they do. I uh, don't know. Could you, could you find out something, a little well, bit? I'm pretty um, sure that, that's it. I, I will delegate that task to you, Elaine. Report no, back to uh, no, 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 you can't get out of it that easily. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that uh, um, not uh, religious hospitals um, uh, do not go by halachic law. Rochelle, do you have any, uh, any knowledge of this in, in your uh, experience of working in uh, the Israeli system? Rochelle, un unmute, unmute yourself, Rochelle, we can't hear you. Yes, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm going back a long way, but um, um, Rabbi Orbach was in fact the POSEC for the hospital, and we did go by halachic law, and there were some very interesting decisions that were made. Um, the one that came to mind that uh, from consultant told me about was there were two people lying in hospital with the same diagnosis, the same problem, and they didn't know what was happening, and one of them died, and the question was whether they could do um, an autopsy on the second on, the, on that man to, to save the life, to, to attempt to save the life of the second person. And uh, I know that he said that Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Orbach was up all night um, making decision, to, you know, looking and making decision. That, that, yes, would have, by, uh, by that would have been in Shari Tzedek, though, yeah? That's Shari Tzedek. That's Shari Tzedek. What, Elaine, what Elaine was asking is, what do the, uh, the regular non-religious uh, hospitals do? And I, I suspect they go by Israeli law, but what Israeli law is on the idea of autonomy, I don't know, but I, I'm guessing, and I'll, I'll have a look, but I'm guessing that it is probably more in line with Western society than it is with Halakha. Yeah. That's my yeah. guess, but I could be wrong. Yes, Hilary. Sorry, just one question, because I, I seem to have had a different idea on reading what you wrote um, about the treatment, the, what the woman had done for her son. I thought that she'd done this treatment um, before taking him to the doctor to see if she could help cure him, right? And the other people in the group seemed to think that, no, she'd done this anyway. It was nothing to do with the flu or what have you. Yeah, no, no, it's right. they were right. He, he had right. the flu and he took the shirt off to listen to his chest and he saw these so things. So she'd just done this, she'd just done this stump. No, nothing to do with so, the flu. She'd done something for right. whatever, so or whatever reason I it was. I didn't understand. I didn't understand that. Okay, okay. Thank you. No, there was nothing wrong with the flu. That's why she did it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any other comments before we uh, uh, before we call it a day? I'm here, I don't know if you can hear me. You can hear you, Cynthia, yes, go okay. ahead. Um, I wish you would all say complementary medicine, not alternative. Complementary okay. medicine, it's used properly and correctly together with modern uh, medicine and when used together, not as an alternative. And uh, I object strongly to the use of the word alternative. It's okay. complementary. I agree with you 100%, Cynthia, 100%. Uh, alternative medicine, it, it can be a problem when it is used as an alternative. However, if it is used in complement with uh, other branches of medicine, it can be of a very great use. I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, complementary medicine is to be applauded, 
alternative medicine is to uh, be a little bit wary of uh, because you may well be finding that you are uh, doing away with things that might help you. So I agree with that comment 100%, Cynthia. Thank you. I, I disagree with that concept because complementary means that the system still exists as it is and you'll only accept and an addition to what is being done by the, the allopathic physician, that's the only thing you can accept. The no, fact that's is not true. That that's an alternative cool. is a good. I don't. Yeah. Oh, no, I know it's called I, complementary, but it's called it's called alternative and complementary medicine in the United States in the in the in the uh, yeah. National Institutes of Health. But the fact is. If you start adding to the normal treatments that are part of the, the, the agenda for, for the practice of medicine, you will probably do more harm than if you don't do anything. So I, I don't agree with that. Well, I think you and I are just going to have to disagree on that, uh, Nachum, because I think you're way off the mark with that. But I'm not the, this is not the forum to get into it. Yes, Joseph. Yeah, can I just uh, say a brief word about that last uh, question uh, in case number two, uh, the procedure described by the um, rabbis uh, in Jewish books. And of course, there are lots of cures in the Gemara. Uh, Avodah Zorah, for instance, uh, has a number and they're in other areas as well. I think that the distinction is this. If a person goes to a doctor, to a licensed doctor, in most Western countries and says, I want cure X as described in the Gemara, and I want you, Dr. So-and-so, to do that for me. The doctor has to say, no, that's not today's scientific medicine, which is what I got my license for. You can do what you want, or you can go to a Rav who may do this for you, but I, as a doctor, cannot do that for you. And that's the distinction. So um, a licensed doctor has to follow, so to speak, what are the rules of how the, the doctor got their license in most uh, Western countries. And that's not according to the um, um, Gemara necessarily. And if a person wants uh, the treatment as prescribed in the Gemara, they have to go elsewhere. I uh, agree with that entirely. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I would go further even. I would go even further than that and say, that somebody who uh, uses uh, treatments which have no evidence based behind them, whether they be in the Gemara or the Quran or the alternative uh, textbook of medicine or wherever they are, if they do not have any evidence based behind them, then I would go further and say that that doctor was not fulfilling his mitzvah of rapo yirape because he has an obligation to use uh, treatments which have evidence behind them. I uh, fell foul of this once uh, fairly early on in my career. Uh, I had a lady came to me of a Hasidic persuasion who said to me that she had been to a makubal um, and uh, this makubal had said that she must have, um, uh, she must have um, vitamin C for her uh, for her, whatever it was. I can't remember what it was. Um, and um, I, can't, I don't remember what it was. Let's say it was diabetes. It was something for which there was no evidence uh, that vitamin C worked. I know that there are lots of things that vitamin C does work for, but this was one that it didn't, according to the evidence. Anyway, I was a bit put out by this. I was young and rather arrogant at the time. Uh, and I said, well, I'm not giving you that because I don't think it works. Uh, anyway, she persuaded me and I gave her uh, five milligrams of uh, ascorbic acid, which is about the equivalent of having a sniff of an orange. OK, that's how much vitamin C I gave her. Right. Anyway, she came, she found out really that I had sort of done this and had not really taken her McCubbel uh, seriously. And she came back to me and she said, that's the trouble with you. And my partner at the time. She said, that's the trouble with you. You're tainted by the Goyesha world that you've come from. Um, 
she she was soon to be an ex patient, uh, and uh, uh, I, I I never sort of treated her again. Uh, Not due but, to her dying from lack of vitamin C. No, I don't think she I don't think she ha had scurvy. But uh, in any event, uh, I probably wouldn't behave like that today, having a little bit more maturity. I would probably just give her a vitamin C and say, well, okay, it won't do you any harm. Um, but uh, the, the point the point is that I was asked to give a treatment which I didn't think was efficacious and there was no evidence for it on the basis of a McCubble. Uh, now, you're right. I should have said, so well, go to the McCubble and get it. Don't come to me. Uh, but I didn't. So there you are. Reality is that as a doctor practicing Western medicine, you have authorities to whom you are responsible. Um, and if you do something, or for that matter, don't do something that causes the patient harm, um, or is against the rules, you run the risk of losing your license. Okay, now that's very interesting. You should mention that, Viv, because I didn't have time to go into that. But there's, that is another issue that Rev Moshe Feinstein brings up. And that is that if uh, by doing something you are putting your career at risk, then you are not obliged as a doctor to do it. Al pi halacha. Um, and, and that is very clear. And, and that, that all, I also had an experience, not me personally, but my, uh, uh, my uh, partner had an experience where he was asked uh, by somebody uh, after a, a, a tragic um, cop death to, um, to falsify the records uh, in order that there shouldn't be a post-mortem. Um, uh, uh, and uh, Diane Aaron-Troy, um, who should have a Rafur Shlema, uh, said to him at the time, don't be stupid. Are these people going to go and look after your kids and put bread on the table when you've lost your license? So you certainly will not do such a thing. Um, but uh, yes, you're absolutely right, Viv. Uh, and and Ramosha Feinstein is very clear about that, that uh, we as doctors uh, are not obliged and certainly must not do something which is likely to cause uh, uh, that sort of thing to happen. Okay, anybody else? Don't know about you, but I'm gagging for a cup of tea, so let's call it a day. Thank you. I will, I will send out, uh, I'll send out the recording, well, Av Avril will send out a recording and will also send out the uh, um, missing piece of the jigsaw for you, the halachic approach to autonomy. Uh, and uh, next week, uh, I'll, on Sunday or Monday next week, I'll send you out the worksheet for next week's uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Shabbat Bye. Bye.